Listen, my name's Alex. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with sexual integrity, and I struggle more than I care to admit with anger issues. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you who are here in this place with us tonight and welcome all of you who are joining us online at our other locations. You may notice that I'm Alex. I am not Mark. Uh, Mark and I don't look quite as similar as we once did. If you'd... <laughs> If you'd met me five years ago, you would have thought we could have been at least related. Um, but Mark is actually at one of our satellite locations in Ottawa this week because they are celebrating their one-year anniversary tonight. <laughs> now, before we get going, why don't you uh, join me in a word of prayer to God? God, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be in this place, to come together tonight to worship and learn more about you. God, I really know nothing. I don't even know what I'm doing standing up here. But you have a word to give to your people. And I ask God that you allow me the opportunity to present a word that is yours that the words that I speak not be mine, that my mind be yours, that my heart be yours, and that this message touch the lives, the hearts, and the minds of all who are hearing it. That when they go out from this place, that they may better know you, that they may have a better relationship with you, and that they may take something to carry out into the world so that your light will shine through them, not only in them, but to others who come in contact with them. All this we ask in the name of your precious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, we have been talking about six keys to sobriety. You may have noticed this is the seventh week of six keys to sobriety, if you've been paying attention. That probably didn't bother just me, or maybe it did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, we're going to talk about something that, quite frankly, I don't really like talking about. I don't think most of us like talking about it. Tonight, we're going to talk about humility and what it means to be humble. Now, first off, I just have to say, and I think we're all aware of this, humility in general gets a really bad rap. And that doesn't matter if we're talking about the church or AA or society in general, because what we tend to do is we conflate the word humility and humiliation. We think that being humble means that we have to somehow be humiliated. Now, the difference is that when we're humble, we put the needs of others ahead of ourselves. When we're humble, we think of others before we think of ourselves. When we are humiliated, it's when we make someone feel bad or when someone makes us look bad or foolish, especially in like a public forum or arena. Or it, it, it doesn't have to be large scale. It can be one-on-one. -on -one. But generally with humiliation, what happens in the end is that I feel slighted. I feel like I am less than. That's the, the difference between humiliation and humility is that with humility, we're giving power to the other person, not taking power from the other person. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. You guys haven't seen me up here a whole lot recently uh, for good reason. I've spent the last two months learning what it means to be a father, not only to, thank you, not only to one child, but to two children. Um, so if you've ever been a parent, you know what that's like, but there's just a small subset of us who have been parents to multiples. Um, so there may only be a handful of people in this room, if that, who actually understand exactly what that looks like. Uh, but there's something about becoming a parent that is very humbling. Because 
I can't be first. I can't. Um, selfishness is out the window because there are these two new lives that are wholly dependent upon my wife and I in order for their survival, right? Not, not just so that, I mean, they don't do a whole lot. Let's just be honest. They, they eat, they sleep, they poop. That's kind of it. <laughs> um, and it's going to be that way. And they cry. We can't forget that. They cry. Um, but that's not what we focus on, right? They're beautiful children, and they smile, and they coo, and they make these noises that just make you go, <sighs> and you just kind of melt away. And it's those moments that make child rearing completely worth it. And I don't know about you, but my wife and I have spent <laughs> most of our waking moments for the last two months giving them our all. Uh, and, and I had a really cool experience for the first 48 hours of their lives because my wife was essentially bedridden. So while she could breastfeed if I handed her a child, she couldn't change them, she couldn't bottle feed them, she couldn't get up to pick them up and set them down. For the first two days, I was their everything. They didn't really know that, but I knew that. And, and I was really kind of expecting that the nurses might give us some help <laughs> before I showed up. But when the nurses didn't step in to help, I couldn't have cared less because those children were mine and they were my responsibility and I had to humble myself to take care of them. Now see, the thing about being humble is that it's, it's not being proud or arrogant. And I don't know about you, but when I was living in active addiction, everything was about me. It didn't matter what anyone else needed. It didn't matter what anybody else wanted. It just mattered that I could do whatever it took to get my next fix, my next hit, to take care of me. So in order to humble ourselves, we have to destroy that power dynamic. We have to destroy the independence or the will in ourselves and submit that to God. But here's the problem with humility. The big book says it like this. For us, the gaining of a new perspective was unbelievably painful. It was only by repeated humiliations that we were forced to turn something about hum learn something about humility. It was only at the end of a long road marked by successive defeats and humiliations and the final crushing of our self-sufficiency that we began to feel humility as something more than a condition of groveling despair. And I think that groveling despair is our understanding generally of what it means to step into humility. But that's not what it means at all. Anyone in here ever taken the first step? When we admit that we're powerless over our addiction, when we admit that we're powerless over our compulsive behaviors, when we admit that we are powerless over sin, because whether we say it like that or not, that's the truth, and that's really what we're turning over. Even though at step one, we don't know that we're turning that over to God, we're turning it over to God. That is where we make a humble admission that we are powerless. It's the first step toward our liberation is stepping into humility. We just don't have the language to define it like that. We barely have the language to say, I'm overwhelmed, let alone to recognize the humility that is taken up in that. See, the, the big book goes on to say, as long as we placed self-reliance first, sorry, it's actually the 12 and 12, <laughs> a genuine reliance upon a higher power was out of the question. That basic ingredient of all humility, a desire to seek and do God's will, was missing. That is not only the key to our sobriety, 
It's the key to our life. Because to seek and do God's will is God's intended plan for us. So whatever we're doing against seeking and doing God's will is walking outside the intentions of God. And I think a lot of us have spent so much of our lives walking in the wrong direction, walking away from God intentionally or otherwise, that this feels so ridiculously uncomfortable. But if, when we start to do it, and we see that others have gone before us, and we find a way to continue down that path, we can find true wisdom, true joy, and true freedom. When we were living in active addiction, seldom did we look at character building as something desirable in and of itself. We didn't really care about how kind we were. We didn't really care about how gracious we were. We didn't really care about how thankful we were. See, character, at least as it was scrawled on the blackboard in my parents' house my entire life as a child by my mother, and it never went away, character is doing what is right when no one else is watching. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but when no one else was watching me, I sure as heck wasn't doing anything right. That was the primary opportunity in isolation to do the one thing that I wanted to do. And that one thing was absolutely and unabashedly wrong. We never thought of making honesty, tolerance, and true love of man and God the daily basis of our living. True love of humanity and God. If we can humble ourselves, if we can find a way to say, God is God and I am not, if we can get through steps one, two, and three by saying, I can't, God can, and I think I'll let him, we will walk into humility. We will walk into the grace of God that just exists. Self-reliance, which is where many of us live, is like recycling your own air. Do you have any swimmers in the room? Because I can't think of a whole lot of other people who would actually attempt to do this. Uh, maybe circus performers. Um, like, especially guys who do escape tricks, like Houdini. Um, there's this trick that, especially when you're underwater, you take a di big, deep breath, the biggest you can, and when it runs out, you can recycle the air that you've already breathed, but you can only swallow it back down once or twice because that air very quickly becomes stale. And if we keep swallowing that stale, unoxygenated air, we'll pass out. And that's what we do when we rely on ourselves. Because we're sick, we think we can get better at breathing our own air. But what we have to do is find a place or a person or a thing or a higher power, or God, outside of ourselves, that provides us with fresh breath, fresh air. There's no coincidence that in the ancient languages the Bible is written in, breath and air and spirit are all the same word. Because God breathes his spirit into us, and he is breathing his life into us. Twelve and twelve says about the fifth step that only by discussing ourselves, holding back nothing, only by being willing to take advice and accept direction could we set foot on the road to straight thinking, solid honesty, and genuine humility. To those who have made progress in recovery, humility amounts to a clear recognition of what and who we really are. 
when we're living in addiction, when we're living with someone in addiction in our lives, it's hard to see the world as it really is. When we step out of that, and it might be just this tiniest little baby step, we begin to accept and recognize that we have potential to become something, to become someone different, to become someone better, to become someone who has something not just to get, but to give back. When we're honest with another person, it confirms that we have been honest with ourselves and honest with God. Somebody came up and asked me a couple of weeks ago, when we share with God ourselves and another person, can I share with another person with whom I was acting out? Like, really? Um, I mean, you can share with anyone. You can share with a priest or a rabbi or a homeless bum under a bridge who you'll never see again. But if you want some honest feedback, if you want someone to speak truth into your life, you need to share with someone who's been where you are. You need to share someone who has that experience. You don't need to share with someone who already knows everything you did unless you're sharing with God. Because God knows, but when we make the effort to admit to God what we have done, we humble ourselves and make God greater and ourselves less. You see, humility is the foundation of each of the 12 steps. Humility is actually the key to sobriety. I can't think of any place in the big book or the 12 and 12 or the 12 steps and 12 traditions where it says, stop. Not one time. But what it does say is that we change who we are. We change how we think. And when we change what we've been, we become something different. And when we become something different, we can't keep doing what we've always done. We can't keep getting what we always got because it's not going to satisfy us anymore. See, humility is this very elusive character trait. The minute you think you've got it, it's gone. A person displaying humility, though, is one who acts stable, steady, calm, patient, open-minded, non-judgmental, temperate in attitude. Man, I got to work on that. And realistic. Listen, listen, you laugh, but like take someone who struggles with anger and give them very little sleep and little demons that scream a lot. I mean, they're beautiful <laughs> creatures that, that not only my wife and I made, but God created. The thing is, so, sorry, we're feeding the kids the other night, and I've got my son in my arms, and he starts to just spit up, and it's just pouring down his chin and all over his chest, and I'm trying to clean it up with a rag, and while I'm trying to clean it up, he just goes, bleh. <laughs> and I mean, it's like, my beard is not twisted, so it's, it's in my beard, it's on my hoodie, he threw up in my mouth. <laughs> Did I get angry? Praise God, no. My wife and I just died laughing because you can't get angry at that. And that's the way that God is with us. Like, we vomit all over God. And God's like, I got your back. He just does. But the thing about humility is there are like three stages of realization with humility. We make that first admission that we're powerless and that is a way that we humble ourselves, but we're really kind of humbling ourselves out of necessity. We, we go, gosh, uh, all these people who've been telling me I have a problem, they're not wrong. I really do have a problem. And I guess I'm gonna have to make myself less 
and make something in my life greater if I'm going to get better. So we, we come to humility out of necessity. But from that, as we get into the program, as we work the steps, and we talk to our sponsor, and as we're held accountable, and as we really learn more about not who we've been, but who we were supposed to be, and who God wants us to be, we realize that humility is the key to freedom. It's kind of like when we get to steps eight and nine, and we go, ask, oh, we really don't. When we go to make amends, we're not really asking for forgiveness. What we're asking is for someone to accept our place of humility. We're stepping into something that's very uncomfortable, like horribly, ridiculously uncomfortable. And it doesn't matter what that person says back to us. We have made ourselves humble in their sight and in the eyes of God, and we've said our piece, and saying it in and of itself should be enough to give us peace because that is freedom. And when we find that freedom, humility goes from being a necessity to the key to freedom, to something that we desire to be a part of our daily life, something that we pray for in the morning. God, grant me an opportunity today to practice humility because being humble doesn't mean getting trampled. It means allowing ourselves an opportunity to be vulnerable and allowing ourselves the opportunity to serve someone else. Because guys, we've spent years, if not decades of our lives serving ourselves. And that's the thing about the 12th step is that's our opportunity to take what we have and give it back to others. And you know as well as I do that when we start 12th stepping somebody, they're not really hearing what we have to say and they're not really grateful for what we have to say but by God, if they actually catch some of that down the road, they're gonna be exactly where we are today. But in order to get there, you and I, we have to stop fighting. See, that person that we're 12th stepping, they're still fighting. Everything we throw at them, it doesn't matter how kind or how humble or how nice it is. Like, they are dueling us with swords in both hands because they're on the defensive, because deep down, they know that what they're doing is wrong. And they know that what you're saying, whether they want to admit it or not, is right. We've been talking a lot the last couple of weeks about the cycle of addiction and how we go to our drug of choice and then we feel guilt and shame and remorse and because we feel guilt and shame and remorse, we go, oh, I should probably do that again because it makes me feel so good. Um, and that we need an interruption to get out of that cycle. The ultimate interruption for us is calling a ceasefire. It's taking those swords or that battle axe and laying it down. It's submitting and surrendering and giving over our spiritual selves. Because at the basis of this disease is a spiritual issue. I don't care how much Suboxone or Vivitrol we throw at this disease, it's not going to solve or fix our problems. We can medicate ourselves to the ends of the earth but there's still something in each of us that we are not addressing. So we have to have our spiritual crucifixion. The, in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, he wrote this, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I know you guys go to meetings, at least 
some of you, and if you don't, you should. And I know you've heard somebody say, hi, my name is, and I'm a grateful. I remember hearing that the first time I set foot in the rooms. You know what I don't remember? Saying that the first time I set foot in the rooms. Because A, I didn't want to be there in the first place. And I sure as heck didn't have anything to be grateful for. But now, over five, almost six years later, although I haven't been clean all that time, I'm able to say, hi, my name is Alex, and I'm a grateful sexaholic in my home group meeting. Because I have learned what it means to be grateful for the person, grateful for the experience, and grateful for the moment. In those words to the Galatians, Paul said, by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The thing about that love, the thing about that giving himself up, we didn't do anything for that. And we don't have to do anything for that because grace is a pre-existing condition. The activity and the work of God are going to continue whether you accept that or not. God is already working in your life. If you've never met God, fine. If you've never said, hi, God, fine. If you've never said a prayer in your life, God is already at work in you. Grace exists prior to what we do. Grace exists prior to what we say. Grace created us. Grace formed us. Grace breathed life into us. And grace goes before everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't say that we have to believe to receive. The grace exists. All we have to do is say yes to that grace. See, when I say that grace is pre, a pre-existing condition, what I mean is that the grace is already flowing. So uh, anyone ever used like a spigot outside their house? Um, the deal with a spigot is that the water is sitting right there, ready to go whenever we turn the knob on the spigot. We have this idea that if the water is not flowing, it must not be on. But just behind the valve is that water waiting to escape. The spigot is on. Whether we know it or not, whether we see it, whether we feel it, that water is on and that grace is available. It's not about anything that you have. It's not about anything you do. It's not about anything you deserve because none of us are deserving, but it's there and it's just waiting and God is just waiting. But while God is waiting, God is working. If God wasn't working, you wouldn't be in this room tonight. Amen. If God wasn't working, somebody wouldn't have pushed you through those doors. If God wasn't working, I wouldn't have taken the ultimatum that I was given because that's what it took to get me in these rooms. But it was that ultimatum that helped me find sobriety, that helped me find fellowship, that helped me rediscover what it means to live in the grace of God. Amen. The Bible says this, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm because we are united with Christ Jesus. Amen. We were dead, but God raised us along with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Y'all, like, I got two spigots on my house, one in the front 
and one in the back. But that doesn't mean I have any more water available to me than anyone else. And I might be standing up here tonight by the grace of God, but that doesn't mean I have any more grace than anyone else. We all have the opportunity to accept the grace that God has made available to us. The grace that is flowing in and around all of us right now. God has taken the step of providing us with grace and pulling us into this room. What are you gonna do about it? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, amen.